There are a lot of different ideas out there about corsets. From myths about rib removal to studies discussing the link between corsets and decreased anxiety. While there is a lot to be said about both of those topics, I want to discuss the actual individuals who wore the corsets back in the Victorian and Edwardian eras, in the hope that we can better understand just what they actually look like. Hello, my name is Alora, and in this video I would like to discuss with you how people today are different from people of the past. Now I'm not talking genetic differences, I'm talking about how their environment physically shaped them in a way that most of us will never experience, and how understanding that might change our views on corsetry. I've heard quite a few people on YouTube mention how we, today, are no different than those who came before us, and in lots of ways I would completely agree with them. But if you look at the research, you will find that we are different in a few ways. It would seem that most people today are fixated on the waist measurement, an actual number, a physical size. And looking around us today, that size is in comparison, pretty tiny. But I think it's important to give that number some context. We can't just judge based on what our individual perception of normal is. So let's start by defining what the Victorian waist size actually was. It seems likely that the average corseted waist measured about 24 inches. Comparing many garments from different collections from extant clothing, you will find 24 inches at the waist to be one of the most common measures, despite what some popular outliers in museums may make you think. Now another resource we have when looking at waist measurement of the times is actually patterning books. So this guide was originally published in 1895 by Chase Hecklinger, and in it he gives information on how to draft patterns for popular women's garments of the time. He also provides example measurements to give you a starting point and how to adjust those measurements for different body types. However, he also gives measurements for large and stout figures as well. So it seems reasonable to believe that that 24 inch waist measurement that he provides as the starting point for average clothing piece that he patterns is probably close to what the average person's waist of the time was. And again, linking that to modern day, that 24 inch waist seems minuscule in comparison to the average today, which according to the CDC is 38.7 inches. But we're here to talk about context. We can't compare the average woman today to that of the average woman over a century ago. And I think we can all agree that it makes complete sense to expect the waist measurement of somebody who is of average height or even taller to have a waist measurement that is larger than that of somebody who is perhaps a little vertically challenged. <laughs> so when the CDC also says that the average woman today is five foot four, it would be fair to assume that, for instance, my waist measurement, being as I am five foot two, should be smaller than that 38.7 inch. And indeed, that assumption would be correct. Now, let's imagine for a minute that you are even shorter than me, that you live in Victorian England, back before a lot was known about proper nutrition, back when the average person didn't have the access to abundant food supplies that many of us do today, and what food that was available wasn't fortified to make sure nutritional needs were being met, nor was it stuffed with extra sugars to make it easy to achieve a healthy calorie allotment. Instead, there was a lot of malnutrition, and malnutrition in formative years can lead a person to not reach their full potential height. So when I tell you that according to the NCD, in the year 1896, the average woman in the UK was a flat five foot, I hope you readjust your thinking about Victorian body size just a little bit. Now, knowing that malnutrition was rampant at the same time that corsets were in style, that means we do have to consider weight. Don't get me wrong. For sure, 
people of all weight ranges existed in the past just as they do today. Costuming Drama did a live stream as part of a co-COVID video last year where she talks about size inclusion and extant clothing, and it is very informative. I highly recommend it. But to reinforce the point she makes there, we can go back to our pattern drafting book, as noted before, and we can see that the measurements for a large form that are provided is a 28 inch waist, and the measurement for a stout form is a 33 inch waist. However, thinking about the prevalence of those large and stout forms, we have to consider that malnutrition problem we discussed. So let's look at a group of women whose nutrition and diet needs were a little bit different than ours today. In 1951, there was a national study of British women that actually recorded the participants' waist circumference as well as their heights. Now in 1951, food rationing was still a thing, and it had been for 11 years. So while this didn't result in rampant malnutrition, it did allow for a less calorie-dense diet than what we consume today. And what the study ended up finding was that the average woman's height was actually 5 foot 2 with a waist circumference of 28 inches. And 28 inches seems a lot closer to that Victorian 24 inches that we discussed previously. And they're still 2 inches taller than their Victorian counterparts. Now, the last element that contributed to physical differences that I want to talk about today is something called waist training. And this is a term you might have heard of. It's the general theory that by wearing a corset or some sort of garment that provides slight to moderate pressure on the torso on a regular basis for a prolonged period of time, you can result in permanent or semi-permanent body modification in the form of a reduced waist measurement, or potentially creating a more conical ribcage. This is something that we can see happening to the bones of Victorian women. Generally, this has a larger impact on people with more flexible ribs. Ah. Yeah, so children. <laughs> uh, they had a higher percentage of cartilage in their bones because their bones were still growing, making them more malleable. I should just note here that I, nor anybody I know in the corseting community, would ever <laughs> recommend a child wear a corset. Just putting that out there. <laughs> But the other thing to consider when it comes to waist training is actually how it impacts your muscles as well. So for instance, when you exercise and your muscles are sore, this is because you put little tiny tears in those muscles. And when they are healing, while being impacted by the shape of a corset, it, encour it encourages the muscles to grow in a way that is different from how they normally would. And that altered growth can help retain a more permanent waist reduction. Meaning, when those young ladies and girls are going about living their daily lives, having to move, bend, and generally live a fairly active lifestyle while wearing a corset, the result should be fairly obvious. A slightly smaller waist develops. We can see similar body modifications resulting from clothing worn in today's world. There's a very good chance that you or somebody you know has experienced this as a result of wearing bras. When you remove your bra, and there's no longer a bra strap on your shoulder, and yet you still have that, like, permanent indent in your shoulder, yeah, this is kind of a similar concept. The body's natural tissues kind of move to adjust for that consistent pressure over time. Another example of this would actually be the braces worn in treatment of scoliosis. These are worn in an attempt to prevent the body's curved spine from becoming even more curved, as might happen if they weren't wearing the brace, which is a good thing, but it just goes to show that braces and corsetry achieving similar things as the brace can physically impact the bone growth and development of a person. Now there is one thing that I really would like to clear up as far as misconceptions go about corset wearing in children in the Victorian era. The term corset doesn't always mean what you think it means. For instance, in this advertisement from the Omaha Daily Bee from 1891, you can see a children's corset waist. It was not uncommon for children to start wearing these at age one or even a little before their first birthday. 
Now, before somebody gets very upset by the notion of a one-year-old in a corset, please remember that these corsets are different from what we immediately think of. These garments did not restrict the waist. They were intended more for back support and to encourage proper posture, and they were worn by any gender. And again, this is not something that I would recommend you do to your child. This is just what they did then. So as I looked at a lot of other advertisements, I was able to come up with some general age ranges for different types of corset wearing. It seems that around age 8 to 12 was when young girls donned a sort of training corset. It seemed to have been generally more shapely than those worn at earlier ages, but still not intended for waist reduction. However, around ages 12 to 14, it seems like they started to wear corsets that did have some waist shaping in them, but they still were not quite as shapely as the adult women's corsets, which would have been donned around age 14 to 16. Also, interesting tidbits, adult men would also wear corsets. Not all men did, but it wasn't unheard of for some of them to do this. Now, by this point, I hope that 24-inch waist number seems a lot more plausible. Between the malnutrition causing them to be shorter than their 1951 5'2 counterparts with that 28-inch waist, and the early use of waist training, it is very likely that the average Victorian woman experienced only a slight reduction in her waist size while wearing a corset. She would not have been tight-laced, or reducing by 4 or more inches. Okay, so last week I promised you all that I would talk about my own personal experience with corsetry. Now, to start with, I have made well over a dozen corsets and corset-like items in my time, both modern corsets as well as bodies and stays for historical reenactment purposes. There is a glaring gap in this experience though, and that would actually be Victorian and Edwardian corsets. I have never done any reenactment of that era and only recently started really diving into it. But between modern corsets and more historical support garments, I do find the more historical ones more comfortable. And I am optimistic that I will also prefer late 19th century corsets to the average modern one. This could be because I'm not really looking for waist reduction, as my natural body is quite shapely. Also a lot not all, of modern corsets tend to be quite heavy, as well as having a fair amount of steel in them. I do want to briefly touch on my own body measurements really quick. Um, for starters, when I was in high school, I was 5'1", and I weighed 105 pounds, which is a healthy weight for a teenager of that height, and my waist measure was 22 inches. And that's smaller than our Victorian friends. I think this is important to note. Just as all body types exist today, so they did historically. And I am a pair, so I think it's rational to look at those corsets with smaller than 24 inch waists in museums and think that they might have belonged to people like me, young people who are just naturally small-waisted. But I'm not really going to delve into that, other people have in other videos. But I will tell you my measurements now that I am fully grown or at least the measurements that I usually have when COVID hasn't allowed me to put on a few more pounds than I probably should have. <laughs> but anyways, um, normally my waist measures 24 inches and my hips are about 18 inches larger than that with a bust being 10 to 12 inches larger. Just, you know, depending on the whole female time of the month bust size thing. <laughs> So that to give you a basis, um, I do actually have three different support garments that I've made that I would like to show you that all have a 24 inch waist, and then one that I bought that has a 22 inch waist that I would like to compare, just so you can get a bit of an idea of these different historical garments. So this is the first one. It is based on Queen Elizabeth's effigy stays, which date back to 1603. They are entirely boned with reed, and they are very comfortable. They weigh 189 grams, so that's about 0.4 pounds. Now, this one is just kind of a general Regency-era undergarment 
This dates from the early 1800s. It is corded, so no bones in it at all, with the exception of a wooden busk in the front. And that garment weighs 167 grams, or about 0.37 pounds. Then there's this one. This is actually the second mock-up, so if you saw my video last week, this is mock-up number two, and it's basically the pattern that I'm going to be using to make the final garment. There won't be another mock-up. And when I weighed this one, which is a recreation based on an extant example from the second half of the 1800s, it came in at 210 grams, or 0.46 pounds. And finally, this is the underbust corset that I bought from Isabella Corsetry. It is actually 22 inches, unlike the 24 of the rest of them, and it's an underbust, so it doesn't even go as high as the other ones. Despite all of this, when I weighed it, it comes in at 585 grams, or 1.3 pounds, almost tripling the weight of the Victorian corset. This weight disparity actually remains fairly constant among my other modern corsets, whether they are ones that I have made or purchased. So for those of you with experience in modern corsetry, I hope this gives you something to think about. Well, that just about covers it for this video. However, consider sticking around if you wanted to see a newspaper article that I found particularly amusing while researching this video. It would also be really cool if you would consider hitting that like or su subscribe, potentially even both, buttons that are down below. If you're wondering what to expect from me next week, it will actually be the completion of the Victorian era corset. Um, I hope you enjoyed this video, and I hope you also enjoy this newspaper reading. Every now and then, some dress reform starts a crusade against the wearing of corsets. This has made little difference in the actual practice, and is not likely to as long as the ladies have their own way, and fashion prescribes the use of the article. And occasionally, the ladies get a chance to hit back. One of them was driving near Oxford, New Jersey, when she was struck by a stray shot fired by boys who were playing with a rifle. Fortunately, the ball hit the steel of the ladies' corsets, and she was uninjured. This reading is from the Belding Banner, October 3rd, 1907. Link will be in the description below.